ha, ha. This is Herschel Gordon Lewis, and you are listening to WithoutYourHead.com. All right, and welcome to the Station of Decapitation Without Your Head. I'm Nasty Neal. That would make me terrible, Troy. Yeah, and tonight we're joined by Victor Bonacore, the director of Diary of a Deadbeat, the story of Jim Van Beber, which I absolutely loved. Welcome mm-hmm. to the show. Welcome. Right on. What's up, everybody? Yeah. So, um, how did the, the how did the whole project come about? Like, when did you start doing this? Um, it was like it was like 2009. I was working uh, for a company called Media Blasters out in New York, um, and I used to book films for them. I uh, then like the theatrical department, so I was booking something, and I remember I got in con- uh, somebody, one of the bookers. I just started talking to, and uh, they were talking about uh, Van Bever and how we both liked him, and then um, I got wind that Jim was selling off some of his early films that have never been released, like his childhood films, uh, uh, regular eight and super eight films that he shot in Greenville, Ohio. And I was like, that's fucking awesome. Like <clears throat> that would be something cool to put out. Cause I'm, I got in touch with Jim and it was like, it's like 25 movies. I mean, some of them are like four minutes and some of them are like 30 but it's from like age 11 to like 17 mm-hmm. and they're awesome. They're like these mini epics. And I was like, yeah, I will, I'm going to put them out. It was going to take it on. And I was just going to get them transferred and then release a DVD of like the unseen Jim Van Bever films. Mm-hmm. But then the more I got to know Jim, I was like, man, I mean, I have all these films. Um, this tells the story of the beginning of his life just through these movies he's made. Why don't I just do a documentary? He's such an interesting guy. He's, um, should be known by more people. So I asked him and he was like, all right. <laughs> so I, uh, went out to California and started shooting a documentary in like 2010. Mm-hmm. Now, had you ever done anything like that before a uh, documentary? Uh, I did a sh- uh, documentary. It's more, it was just like a retrospective documentary on the movie Madman for the oh, nice. code red DVD release. Uh-huh. Um, I, I'm from Long Island, New York. And, uh, I just, someone, I forgot how, I think we were, at Miggy Blessers, we were putting out a movie or something, and uh, they got in contact and with me and this guy, Dave, that worked at Miggy Blasters and asked us to do a documentary. And uh, it was cool. It, it's, you know, it is what it is. It's not it's not groundbreaking or that good. It's just, it's just like a movie made just for Mad Men fans, you know? So yeah. um, it was a cool little project and something to, you know, get the feet wet and, you know, um, and besides that, that was like the first documentary I did like, um, um, you know, something in college, uh, film school. I did like a documentary on, uh, gay couples that adopt children. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that was actually like the first thing. But again, I interviewed like fucking John Waters for that. Oh, wow. <laughs> like at an event and, yeah. Um, there was just like a little college thing, but yeah, that was, that's, that was a documentary experience. So you, you, anyway. so you started in 2010, like so. How long? Uh, how long of a period did you, uh, you know, talk to Jim for for the documentary? Like how long did I shoot it for? Yeah, because it seems like you know there's different um, time periods while you're watching it. It was basically shot from 2010 to 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, random things would happen. There'd be events Jim was going to, or he would start making a new movie. So I was like, oh, that has to be in it now. And um, so, yeah, over the course of about five years, you know, you shoot for a week here, then then, then you edit it, and then a year later, you you shoot something else, you know. So, um, yeah, so about five years. Did he ever get sick of you being around? I'm sure he did. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, we had a good time, too, like out in Cal- when I went out to California. It was really cool. It was really just kind of laid back and uh, uh and cool uh, but you know um when we went to i went to florida to film him uh shooting a new movie mm-hmm. um and uh, i was just part of the crew so i had to kind of you know 
pay my dues as well. I couldn't just sit there on a camera. Mm-hmm. I had to like, you know, get in there and work. So yeah. that's gonna be pretty um, cool though to be on the crew of one of his movies. Yeah, no, it was fucking. It was one of the best experiences ever. Mm-hmm. It, it really was. It's like. Fuck everything I learned in film school. Like what I learned watching, you know, working on a Van Bever set, working on a Frank Cannon Lauder set, like, you know, making your own shit. That that was way better of yeah. an experience and learned way more. What, what was the Van? What was the Hen- Hen- Lauder film you worked on? The Hen- Lauder one. Yeah. Um, we a couple of years ago we went to New Orleans and um, Frank made a movie about Banksy. That oh, a story about these artists from Brooklyn that go to New Orleans to try to find a Banksy uh, that was uh, painted on a wall, mm-hmm. and it's like a it totally non horror. It's kind of just like a road movie mm-hmm. yeah, art film, um, and uh, it was awesome. It was uh, that was an amazing experience too, just like shooting in New Orleans and stuff. But yeah. like you know, again we were shooting on Super Sixteen, and then the Van Bever film we shot on. Push out on sixteen millimeter too, so it was just like being surrounded by film. Yeah, was amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did Did he ever get the the Gator movie finished? Um, no. What they shot was like meant to be like a chunk of the film somewhere in the film. Like it wasn't the right. beginning, it wasn't the end. It was just like um, a, a tool, a basically like a piece that could would be in the film later, but we used it as promotion to kind of raise more money to make it a feature and unfortunately it's still a short film but um it's just so hard to raise money Mm -hmm. that's always weird to me because like it's someone who uh someone who has a following can't like uh has a hard time raising uh money to make a movie and i see a lot of screeners you know through the show and you know quite honestly a lot of them i'm like why why did anyone even put any money into making you know a lot of stuff I see, you know. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it, it's a weird world. It's frustrating, you know. Um, you got to keep on trucking, and yeah. um, you know, shift through the shit. And uh, when did you like easy, easier said than done? I guess too, you know. Yeah. yeah. When did you first uh, see a, a, a Jim uh, Van Beber movie? Uh, actually, it's funny. I was in high school and I had these two, like, metalhead, uh, friends. These guys, this guy, I wasn't a metalhead at all, but, uh, these kids, Tom and Tony, they were awesome. And, uh, they, I would go over to their house and hang out and they'd show me, like, because we were all into horror movies. That's what we basically had in common. And then I go over to their house and they showed me these, this band necrophagia, this VHS tape called Through the Eyes of the Dead. And it's just the fucking most insane. I'd never seen anything like it. And the music video it was like so fucking gory and brutal and fucked up. And I was like, this is fucking crazy. But I didn't like go, oh, that's Jim Van Bever yet. Like I just saw that and it was just insane. And then I saw Deadbeat at Dawn. I rented Deadbeat at Dawn from like my local video store. And then eventually wanted to see more of that guy stuff and then kind of made the connection somewhere. That it was that guy that did the necrophagia stuff, and yeah, so, but it was like Deadbeat at Dawn that like mm-hmm. blew me away. Mm-hmm. Well, what other kind of movies at that time like uh, were you interested in? Well, I it, like when I saw Deadbeat at Dawn. You mean? Yeah. Or even before, like Combat right? Shock, like because you know at that point, I think those are the movies that kind of really got me on the ground, more on the ground stuff because. Yeah, I saw that. I saw Combat Shock around the same time, and Street Trash, and uh, I had seen Basket Case or like earlier than any of those films. But like, mm-hmm. those were the movies that I was like, yeah, that like I want to make movies like this. Like, so that those were the kind of stuff I was getting into at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, the guy that did uh, like Richard Stanley stuff, like Hardware, and yeah, thing, stuff did, like that. Yeah. Cheap plug will be on the show in a couple weeks. I'm pretty, really excited about that. I'm oh, sorry, what'd you say? I just said a cheap plug for us. He'll be on Richard Stanley's gonna be on the show in a couple weeks. Um really Oh, that's that. awesome. Yeah. Really looking forward to that. It's gonna be pretty sweet. Yeah, that's awesome. He's a really interesting guy. Mm-hmm. So, uh um, ha- has Jim seen the movie? I assume he has. Uh, what is he what did he think of it? 
Yeah, he did. He, um, I sent him a copy uh, maybe a month or so after it came out, and uh, he just wrote me back and said, he, you know, he was cool with it. Mm-hmm. He wasn't, didn't seem, he wasn't hateful or he wasn't, uh, you know. <laughs> well, that's good. He, was, he, he just seemed cool. He said that, you know, it was fair, mm-hmm. and I was happy with that, you know. Did he have any, did you ask him about anything while you're editing it? Uh, anything you know you want to leave out or you put in or anything like that? Well, yeah, I definitely let him um, see a very early cut. That was an early cut, you know, like a you know a very rough thing. But I had like an early edit of it that um, you know I let him see, and he, you know, there were some things, of course, that he just was like, you know, that doesn't need to be in there. And, you know, um, and I respected most of them Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the majority of them because I get it. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, but it, it, it it reached a common ground where he was okay with it and I was happy with it. And, um, but yeah, it was, it's all good. Yeah. So the, uh, like the archived interview with him when he's, when he's younger, is that, was that part of, uh. All the movies he had, like the the you know the movies he made when he was younger. No, that actually um, I got that from Andy Cop. Uh, Andy Cop is a really amazing underground filmmaker from Dayton, Ohio, as well uh, same place Jim made films. Um, and Andy uh, just emailed me randomly when I was first starting to do the documentary. And said, "Hey man, uh, I ha- what's your address? I have this interview I shot with Jim from '92. Uh, you can totally use it in your doc. I, that, you know." Oh, that's awesome. And I was like, "That's awesome, yeah. yeah!" So he sent me that, and then like I watched. I'm like, "This is amazing. Um, <laughs> it's like an hour and a half. It's on high eight, and it's just a really good interview. And it just it's added another layer to the documentary because, um, you know, it shows us, you know." a time after college, mm-hmm. you know, like during Debbie to Dawn, he was like 27, I think during that interview. Mm-hmm. So that, and I think we're going to put, um, I'm releasing Jim's, like all of the early films I was talking about yeah. that I purchased back in the day. Um, they've been released on like little, um, VHS releases, but we're finally doing a DVD release of that. And I think we're going to also release, a full interview from 92 on there. Oh, that's pretty, pretty sweet. Um, yeah, because we never did that. We couldn't fit that on the... Uh, put that on there. Mm-hmm. Nice to, for people to see the whole unedited thing. Yeah. So, uh, when you went to Cinema Wasteland, uh, what was that whole experience like? Dude, that was... I mean, it was great. It was... It... <sighs> It was crazy because it was it's such a fucking party atmosphere there, but like not annoying party atmosphere. It's all, mm-hmm. all like minded people, and um, it's just so much fun. And I had only gone there once before that, and you know we had a table and stuff. And then when we took Jim there, just seeing like I knew he had a cool following, but recently being there with like these people who were so fucking enamored by him yeah. was we, like took us all kind of back and we we're like, holy shit, like, this is awesome. It was, it was crazy, man. It felt like it was three days. It, it, it just felt like the longest, craziest party ever. Um, you know, it was insane. I don't know how else to say it. Yeah. And, and, uh, in mostly a good way, you know, it was, um, yeah, I don't know, it was legendary. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, definitely a cool thing to be a part of. And I think kind of, motivated to let the rest of the documentary because coming out of that was like, holy fuck, like that was intense. And then we went right into Dayton after that and started getting like B roll mm-hmm. of, uh, like directly after that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So it was, uh, it was, it was a great, great wild weekend and, um, glad to catch it on camera. Yeah. Was he aware of his following at this point? Like, uh, you know, when he went to Cinema Wasteland, was he aware he already, he already had, like, this big following? Or was it something that, like, kind of took him back, too? Um, I think he was aware of it because there's times when he's gone to, like, you know, he's gone to England, like, right after, like, um, right after he made Deadbeat or it was, like, My Sweet Satan or something, mm-hmm. and he's going out there and the screens just sold out. And, you know, I think it definitely, like, he'd seen um, parts of that called following, 
But I don't know. I think it it might have taken him back. Um, I would have to ask him. That's a, that's actually a good question that I I never really asked him. Mm-hmm. He, you know, um, I don't know. I don't know. It's a uh, he might have been, uh, but it was definitely. I mean, at times I was like fucking, you know, not shocked because I knew, like I said I knew he had a cool following, but it was it was more intense than I thought. Yeah. Now, uh, what what are some of the standout of the of the shorts you're going to be releasing on the DVD? I'm sure they're all cool to watch for different reasons, but like, what are some of the ones that stand out to you? Well, there, like, there's this one called Gateway in, uh, Gateway in the Fear. I think I said that right, and it's like when he was like maybe 15, uh-huh. 16, and it's shot on eight millimeter, and you know they're all the most of them are silent because it's just eight millimeter. There's no uh, sound strip on it. And but they're and I got all soundtracks um, like created for them and uh, the, it, oh, Jim also recorded a commentary track uh, for all the films and um, but on um, Gateway into Fear it's like twenty minutes and it's like there's crazy effects and monsters and it's just such a it's like a little epic yeah. um, it's crazy and then there's a movie called White Trash that he made I think in college and he's like maybe seventeen eighteen. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just badass. It's like kind of a precursor to Deadbeat. And it's got sound. It's actually a Super 8 film with sound on there. And uh, it's really great. It's like Jim uh, is like a a fighter in an underground fight ring. Mm-hmm. And they just like, it's just badass. It's like 15 minutes. And so that's a standout road trip. Yeah, there's a bunch of them, you know. And it's it's even cool to see like a little two-minute um one community is 11 years old because then even in those there's like little head decapitations and you know it's, it's cool yeah yeah so uh did, do you have any uh timeline for when when that'll be available um sometime this year hopefully uh i'm may june sometime early uh around there i w- originally wanted it ready for wasteland cinema wasteland in april but i don't think so mm-hmm. um it's it's basically done. It's just about lining up all the features and stuff and yeah. fine tuning the artwork and stuff. But mm-hmm. so yeah, I would love to have it down by like May, June, mm-hmm. the latest, something like that. Yeah. That's one convention I've never been to. I need to get to a cinema wasteland at some point. You definitely do. Where where are you from? Massachusetts. Oh yeah, it, it'd be a drive, but uh, mm-hmm. it's worth it, man. You should. You guys should check it out sometime. It's, a, it's definitely a fun time. Yeah. So just, uh, like, technically, uh, how much work is that to get to take, like, the stuff that was filmed in uh, Super 8 or you know, different, uh, you know, on film and get it to DVD? How hard is it to get, like, all that together? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not really hard. It, it is It's time-consuming. It's It's more money than anything, you know, you get the films and then you got to find a good uh, place that will transfer it. Mm -hmm. And um, I've gotten them transferred like more than two times because the first time I did it, it didn't look good. And then the second time I found a better place. And then I originally went back and got like an HD transfer. So you get it transferred and then you got to line up the music. So that's, that was the toughest part is getting uh i mean i had a bunch of awesome musicians give me music and bands and stuff that's cool and uh to to put over the films and it's awesome Mm -hmm. some original scores were made uh so it was a lot of that just like lining up music and um putting them all together Mm -hmm. so uh you know yeah uh the people the other people that are in the documentary was everyone like uh on board you know to talk about talk about Jim or was there anybody that was uh you know didn't want to or refused somebody didn't want to do the interview you said yeah um yeah uh I mean to everyone most people I asked if I got in contact with them said yes like they're pretty excited about it I got a couple weird stories I almost had Vincent Gallo in it and that was like the weirdest phone call of my life I was living in New Jersey and I just emailed Vincent Gallo you know the, the director of uh, you guys don't know you know everyone knows Vincent Gallo so what am I saying the guy from uh, Buffalo 66 uh-huh. Brown Bunny and all that jazz he uh, he was I heard he was a big Van Depper fan so I'm like oh man wouldn't it be crazy to have 
Vincent Gallo in my movie to talk to him about Vamp Ever. And uh, I, I emailed him on his website, and then he called me. He left my number. He called me that night and um, was talking to me how much he liked Jim and how he wanted to be in a movie starring him, directed by Jim. I'm like, this is crazy. And I just kept asking if he'd do an interview, and uh, he said he would if, I don't know, he had some other like something through media blasters or another company. He wanted me to try to help him get some contract signed or something. And I just couldn't do it. <laughs> so he wouldn't do the interview. It was very, very strange. I know that sounds like absurd, but it, it kind of was. Yeah. Um, and um, who else didn't um I mean, that's really it. That was like the, you know, uh, I would have loved to have Sage Stallone interviewed. Um, he didn't wa- not want to do it. Uh, he was just a busy dude. And then uh, I, I would have loved to have John Waters in there too, but I couldn't get him in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, I mean, everyone was pretty excited to do it, mm-hmm. which was good. They liked to talk about him. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Did any of uh? Because you said you know the the one guy contacted you to send you the the ninety two interview. Is any of the people you interviewed for the documentary? Uh, people that just came to you to want to be in it, as opposed to like you contacted them. Um, yeah, there definitely were people that said they would love to be in it and talk about them, which was awesome. So, because uh, I I definitely uh, sought out a lot of people, but yeah, it made my life easier because people came. A lot of people came forward with stuff like that, with like photos and um, other things that other leads to things and such. So. I definitely had a lot of help. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What What was uh What's Robert Mukes' connection to uh, Van Beber? Well, who's Robert Mukes? Oh, Robert Mukes. Yeah, he. I think they originally met at the gym, like in L.A. or oh, something okay. like that. <laughs> and um, then they started talking about films and stuff, and became friends. And then I think. Robert Mukes was in a music video that Jim directed for, okay. I think, Pantera. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Jim did a Pantera music video. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was Pantera. Um, or Super Joint Ritual, one of those bands that Robert was in, I um, I believe. And, um, and then they just became friends. And uh, I know Jim wants to work with him, wants to put him in a movie. Oh, very cool. I know Robert yeah. Benny. He's a very cool guy. So uh, yeah, I, oh, I, Robert's awesome. yeah, it was cool to see him pop up. I just didn't, you know, what note the connection was. So that's cool. Yeah, no, he was a super cool guy. He he was one of those guys that was like super gung ho and really wanted to talk about Jim. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, so, yeah, he was awesome. Yeah, and it was cool when it popped up because uh, I saw uh, the Coolidge was in there, and I've been to the Coolidge many times. But uh, I think this was when when did they show the movie at Coolidge when, when he was there? Oh, the Deadbeat screening, that was like 2012, maybe? Because I started going about 2012, so it probably was like right before like I started uh, to know about the Coolidge. Right, yeah, yeah, and that was an awesome theater. Yeah, they screened Deadbeat on film. Um, That was awesome. That was a cool time. Uh, Yeah, we drove out for that, and we got some good footage there. And then we also shot because I was shooting a music video that weekend for Sex Scrimmit, uh-huh. and Jim Jim made a, uh, with Linnea quickly, and then Jim made a, uh, a little cameo in that yeah. in the video, too, because he was in town. Uh-huh. That's really weird, because like, I go to the Coolidge a lot now, and I know uh, the, one of the band members of Sex Scrimmit, and he told me about that video when we first started talking to him, and it's just weird how, <laughs> it's all, awesome. you know, how it all came together then. But, yeah, so, uh, Devin. Devin, yeah, yeah. Cool and though. Devin, Devin Hunt, yeah, Devin, um, he also did, like, a lot, most of the soundtrack for the documentary. Oh, nice. Like him and uh, this other fellow did, like, just made, like, an original score, and it's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's a big shout-out to Devin. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how, did, how do you know Devin? Uh, I had a short film, uh, Ice Cream Sunday, that played at the Boston Underground Film Festival. Oh, nice. Um, oh, man, I don't know what year that was. That was, you know, before Diary. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and um and he was one of the I remember there was like five people in the audience and he was one of them. <laughs> Um, it was super fucking cold. And then I remember like, we just like all sat inside the movie theater <laughs> yeah. and he, we just talked to movies and stuff. And then we became quick friends and he's like, I have a band called Sectionment. They're, you know, we're influenced by divine and stuff. I'm like, Oh man, we're uh, going to be like yeah. best friends. And then we did. And then I made, we made a video. Yeah. He has a divine but, tattoo. I believe. But yeah, that's pretty sweet. Uh, by the way, how could people find those? How could people find the sexcrement, um, videos? Oh, uh, those are on YouTube. Uh, the sex instrument, it's edited version because uh, it's YouTube, but actually right. on the the release of Diary of a Deadbeat, um, one of the special features is like the unend, uncensored, naughty version of the sex instrument video, but it's up there. It's called uh, Trucker Bombed, uh, starring Linnea and a little cameo by Jim. Uh, we shot that at the Friendly Coast, actually. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I've been and, there a um, times, too. Oh, yeah, the one in the one in Boston, really cool in Cambridge. So one it was that the one was in like Cambridge. Yeah. What'd you say? Because uh, there's a couple friendly toasts, but I believe it's the one in Cambridge. Yes, yes, yeah, it's the one in Cambridge. Um, it was really bad. They just like pretty much let us do. They like shut down and let us do whatever we wanted. And a lot of people showed up. Yeah, it was, it was a fun shoot. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what's the reaction been like for uh, Diary of a Deadbeat? The reaction's been great. I'm kind of overwhelming, you know, how good it's gotten, you know. I mean, stuff pops up all the time, little reviews here and there, and, you know, people have their criticisms, and that's that's perfectly, you know, fine and accepted. But uh, people seem to really dig it, and that's, you know, I can't ask for anything more than that. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, really, people seem to dig it, and... His fans like it, and, and you know, a major goal is for people that don't know who he is to to find out about him. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Do you think that's accomplished? Yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, I was going to ask about that. Do you think that's, like, uh, helped maybe, so, like, a new audience uh, uh, find him, you know, who didn't know about him before? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I hope so. Um, I know it has. Um, I know personally some people that have seen it that have just, like, didn't know him but love him, and it's you know, gotten obsessed with his films. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's awesome. I would love it to reach more people too. Yeah. Um, because I think there's even more people, um, that would love his films, you know, they just haven't been able to see him. Yeah. They're hard to find actually. Um, especially, uh, deadbeat at dawn. It's, uh, unless you like, you know, buy like a used copy for a lot. It's hard to find. I've, I've noticed. Yeah. I don't know when that happened, but I guess, yeah, they uh, it is, and Man- Manson's hard to find now, and that original box set, mm-hmm. it's it's become a rare one. I think you can get it on VHS uh, cheaper, and that was a yeah. cool release. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, oddly enough, the uh, DVD rental of uh, of Dead Beat at Dawn is available on Netflix, which I thought was very odd, since it's like really, really? yeah. I actually <laughs> that's, how I did... I, that's how I got it recently. Wow. Yeah. Which I was very shocked. Oh, I was like, Hang on. Cause I, yeah. I, didn't even, I didn't even get the the DVDs anymore. So I just did the streaming, and I saw it was available on on uh, DVD, and I was like, oh, well, I, I gotta uh, up my you know for five bucks the subscription. But but yeah, cause uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd seen it for like ages, so I was like, oh, it must be on DVD. But it was like a hundred dollars for like the uh, the used one. I was like, oh my god, shit. Yeah. So he he should release some of those, I guess. I think they are working on a Blu-ray um, releasing it. Uh, I, I, you know, I know there were some little blurbs about it, so I think that is in the works. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be rad. Yeah. Because um, it's in demand. I know a lot of people that always ask me for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm like, I, I, I think I lent out the DVD to somebody, and I don't think I had a pass. <laughs> yeah. I, I still have the VHS. Uh-huh. I think that's it. <laughs> yeah. Now I do have to ask. Uh, about... Get the DVD back. I would say. <laughs> yes. That actually reminds me of a story. It's really nothing to do with anything, but I always find it funny. Was uh, we had the director of um, the Mutilator on years ago before they put it out on Blu-ray, and he held oh, right on. And he only had one cop. I didn't know it was his only copy, but he sent me a, a Mutilator on DVD to watch before the interview. 
And then so I packed it awesome. Yeah, and so I just thought it was the keyboard. And then like a couple weeks later, he like called me up and he's like, uh, "Can you send that back? It's actually my only copy." And I was like, "Oh, geez, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, Neil. I didn't know that." Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty rad. <laughs> yeah. I'd probably do that. Hey, can I just? That wasn't for you to keep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I didn't know. I felt bad. I was like, God, I'm glad I didn't you know, actually lose it or break it or something. That would have been <laughs> right. <laughs> been awful. My dog, my dog ate in my mutilator. <laughs> yes. So uh, I do have to ask. So, because uh, um, is anyone taken back by his use of the N word in the in, in the film? Yeah. Um. Uh, not that too much though. I actually mm-hmm. thought there would be a little more, um, uh, more backlash. Um, mm-hmm. not use the word, you know, I, I don't like the word and, right. but I think it was used, um, like in, in the opening, I think it's in the opening when like people are giving like quick quotes about Jim, mm-hmm. uh, a fellow filmmaker, Justin Seitz says, you know, he's the true definition of rock and roll. Yeah. And I think that kind of sets the tone that it's not, it's used in a different way. Yeah, exactly. Like that's how he's saying it. Right. It's like the rock and roll one. And, you know, uh, but you know, um, I haven't, I didn't get that much for it. You know, he said it, he didn't say it all the time. He, you know, it was said. Um, yeah. And I, like you said though, it's used and it's not like he's like, you know, damn, you know, blah, blah. it's like, uh, it's used in a different, uh, a different, as a different term than what you would think if you just heard the word, you know what I mean? Right, and and, it, and and people still like hearing it, but I've I've showed lots of people, and uh, you know they understood what it was, you know what the uh, the I don't know <laughs> what I'm trying to say, yeah, but they knew what it. it. Yeah, exactly the contact. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you can, and that's a kind of a hard thing to say, but you know I think people were. Yeah, 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 and for people who, who haven't seen it yet, uh, that might sound odd, but I think when you watch it, you totally understand what we just said. Right, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, am I sounding like a bumbling idiot, like trying to explain this? But I think, yeah, people saw it. It's like, you know, um, the N word was used, and uh, but it was, you know, it was just kind of, mm-hmm. it's used in a way different context than you think. If exactly. that makes any sense. Yeah, exactly. Now, what other kind of uh, stuff are you interested in making besides other uh, documentaries? Oh, man, I started making a movie called blood wings like eight years ago on 16 millimeter uh it was like it you know never got finished but i have a couple producers that are going to help me out and help me finish it and hopefully even shoot on film again because i was gonna um it's like a little more than halfway shot there's just so much more to do so i want to it's it's like a um I don't know how to describe it. It's just like a fucking wacky satanic cult movie. So the satanic cult is the good guys, and they like break up dog fighting rings and um, kill child molesters and kill like God hates fag people. You know, <laughs> good. I can get by. Uh, yeah, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're kind of they like show up once a month during October, uh, you know, and um, they just like help this little girl who's kind of got a shit life and. Um, heavily influenced by the Wizard of Oz. Uh, just more of like a satanic opera kind of way. And uh, so that, I'd love to finish that. And um, uh, I'm going to make a movie called Shit Fuck um, that was written by this um, author, Hannah Neurotica. It was like a short story she wrote. And it's like this lesbian love story, post-apocalyptic, like, roller skate gangs and shit like that. And it's going to be a lot of fun. I think that's going to be a short. So that's probably what I'm going to shoot next. That Those are ones I'm directing. I've been working on a bunch of other films with people. I just made a movie with uh, Louis Justin called The Woodsman, and we shot it all on, like, a high eight camcorder. And, like, oh, just used, like, on-camera mics and shit. Just really wanted to make a... just, like, a shitty movie. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, just like have fun and like not have a script and just like get our friends together and you know, show making movies can be fun again. Mm-hmm. About, about the yeah. satanic movie, Dad, um, do you know any like real Satanists, or is you just something you're just having fun with? 
Uh, do I know any real Satanists? I, yeah. uh, kind of. I do know, I did know a few people that were in the Satanic Church. Uh-huh. Uh, this guy that, like, when I used to live in Jersey, um, I lived with an actress, uh, Ruby LaRocca, and she was, friend, like, really good friends with this guy who was, like, high up in the Satanic Church. He was a super nice guy. Yeah. I think he lives in Boston, actually. I think he lives up there. He's like super smart and yeah, yeah. And I think he's like he. I think he's the dude that has been on like um. He's been on like Fox News and shit, right. and all those news channels, and they like brought this satanic uh, uh baphomet to um. Oh, oh yeah. What, what it? Yeah, I remember. Uh, what was that? Where was that at? Michigan, right? Wasn't it yeah, like Michigan or something? So, yeah, yeah. I remember we were talking about something the like show. That. Yeah, when that happened, I can't remember where it was, but yeah, it was pretty, pretty famous. But yeah. But see, like the the Satanic movie I'm making, I wanted to have absolutely, like, be like factually wrong. Like, I don't want anything <laughs> right in it. Kinda, like, yeah, don't... that's perfect. That's kind of like it. what I was really trying to ask. But yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I want. Not everyone to hate it. Like I want it to be super entertaining, and enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. But I want. I don't want. Any, like I'm not gonna read the Satanic Bible or any <laughs> bullshit like that. Uh, like I'm just gonna make a movie about how I, you know, cheap Satan. I like cheap Satan. Like you know, <laughs> fucking Satan window decals and stuff. Like uh, you know, all the rest of it is, you know. Yeah. It is. I mean, to each their own. Whatever floats your boat. But mm-hmm. <laughs> by the way, uh, Jason Shepard here on the Facebook, he asked. Uh, did you smoke the marijuana in Satan's honor with Jim? I smoked this marijuana in your honor, Satan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of that on uh, shooting the documentary. <laughs> a lot. Uh, yeah, it seemed like he was, there, there was a, a, few drink, uh, a few drinks involved, too, on Jim's side. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. There was probably more grass than anything, but... <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah. But yeah. So uh how do how do people find you online uh to to follow your uh your next projects? Uh I'm on Facebook as my name, man. I'm just Victor Bonacore. I'm on Instagram, uh video Bonacore. Um you can find the documentary, it's on Amazon. I think that's the only you can get it there and then at a convention, um, Masker Video put it out and uh you can go to their website too. They have like the special editions and all like the VHS uh, releases of Jim films. Yeah. Uh, and then they'll be putting out the DVD too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's it. Yeah, Victor Bach or Google my name or Facebook. Yeah, I'll pop up. Yeah. So why why film? Why uh, why do you like to shoot in film? To shoot on film mm-hmm. specifically, yeah. like like Super Eight Sixteen, yeah. stuff like that. Uh, I, I just love it. I love the look. I don't want it to die. Um, I think digital has its place. You know, I don't hate it. it. I've definitely shot digital, but I just don't think you can ever, ever, ever make digital look uh, exactly like film. I think it'll always be some a different thing. Um, I like the, like, shooting on 16 and not seeing what you're shooting. You know, you have to, like, shoot a whole roll of film that costs you over 100 bucks. And it maybe gets, you know, eight and a half, nine minutes. You get it developed, you get a transfer, and you watch it, and then half of it's black, you know? Like, it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of fun in that and a lot of excitement in that. So I love that aspect of it. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you know, we had a projector, like, uh, that we found at a garage sale, like a 16-millimeter projector. I remember the first time when we hooked it up and, like, actually just watched on a wall like what we shot like a week before that and it was it was fucking super rad yeah so how how long had you you wanted to make movies like well, well what age did you decide like this is something you wanted to do I was a kid too I was probably like 12 13 I got I got like a VHSC camcorder for Christmas and was just making like little stupid sketch comedy things or like movie reenactments and I was obsessed with movies then, and I uh, just wanted to make movies. And then I saw, uh, I think Basket Case was the movie. I always credited as the one that was like, yeah, I want to make fucking movies like that. Yeah. You know, I can I can try to do this. Yeah. Basket Case is pretty awesome. 
Oh yeah, I fucking it's one of the best ever. Yeah. What is it about Basket Case that uh that makes it so special to you? Um I get I would probably like I mean, I guess it's on the ground. I mean it's not really it's pretty well known horror film, but um I I lo- at the time I think that was probably the lowest budget thing I'd seen. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, you're a kid when you're, you know, a kid and you're just getting into horror movies. It was like Freddy and Jason and Child's Play and, mm-hmm. you know, all that stuff, which, you know, I loved. But then when you see a movie like Basket Case and it's like super low budget compared to that stuff mm-hmm. and way fucking gorier and more risky, I just, I'd never seen anything like it. And it, and like, I was like, well, it's New York City. Really? And I was from Long Island, which is, you yeah. know, super close to Manhattan. But, I, you know, I was like, man, is that really what this city's like? Or it was like. Uh-huh. Um, it really showed New York as super gritty. Yeah. The characters are awesome. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I love the grittiness of it. Mm-hmm. There's something about all those New York movies of, like, the late 70s and 80s from, like, big budget to low budget movies that have a special feel to them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Totally agree with you. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, New York's not like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah, it was, it's not. It was funny. It was a couple years ago now, I guess it was. We went to Manhattan, and we uh, did. Uh, <clears throat> we went out to lunch or dinner, I guess, in an interview with uh, Joel Reed, who did uh, Blood Sucking Freaks. Oh yeah, yeah. It was, that That's was awesome. awesome. And uh, but he walked around, and he was just saying how how different everything you know was. Uh, you know, he said, be he, over here, he used to be like, you know, pervs would come out and, like, expose themselves to you. And, and, <laughs> yeah. But, but he said it, like, in a, he was disappointed that it's no longer like that. Yeah, he was kind of sad that those were gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like, that was my He's deal. sad. Yeah. It wasn't hookers on every corner anymore. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's good to be able to walk down the street and not get mugged like that. <laughs> You know, I, I'm 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 cool with that, but also, you know, the gentrification there is out of control, and you know, it's like it's lost a lot of its uh, a lot of that dirt under the fingernails, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what I always said from like New York to LA. Like New York always had a little more dirt under the fingernails, but you know, yeah. I don't live there anymore. I live in Ohio, so. I, whenever I go back, I just hang out in Long Island. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, Kevin Van Hentenrick from the Basket Case movies, now he he's a he's a stone carver. Yeah, I think I met him when I was like, you know, 19 or something at a convention. And I think he had like cards there for that and stuff. Yeah. That's, and it's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool because he does a he does a free uh, stone carving seminar every summer, and, and uh, we go every year. And uh, oh, and it's cool. It's like you learn to carve stone from uh, from the guy from Basket Case, but no one there knows that's what he that, that he's from those movies. They just think he's like this. You that know, must the be pretty wild. Yeah, though. he's just the town stone carver. Which is right. It, well, it's like in the, like at the documentary I said I worked on the Madman one. Uh-huh. The guy that played you guys know the film Madman, yeah, right? Yeah, um, the 80s oh, yeah. The eighty slasher. Yeah. Well, Mad Paul Man Ellers Man. is the guy who played the monster in it, yeah. and um, he, you know, and he lived on Long Island. He was like the nicest guy. It was like pretty much the only film he ever done, and he was so fucking proud of it. And like I, you know, and like I remember, you know, no one knows this guy is the killer and madman, but you know, he had an attic full of like madman masks and shit people made him. Oh, and that's stuff. too and cool. I I love that. Yeah, that's in the doc. It was unbelievable, man. Like people that are just like obsessed with that movie, and and he was so such a charming guy. Just think, I love that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. He's a cool guy. And then he went on to make knives for a long time, which is pretty cool, too. Yeah. He made, like, knives that, like, Stallone bought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah he's oh, awesome. that's totally badass in itself. Yeah. Yeah, he's really cool. So, uh, yeah. So you grew up watching, you know, uh, kind of like myself, watching a lot, and Troy here, watching yeah. a bunch of Yeah, you lived like our childhood. Our, our yeah. And, uh, and I, from what I understand, also watching wrestling. Oh, oh wrestling? Yeah. That I didn't get like the first part of 
of what you said. I was saying, um, uh, much like a Troy and I, you grew up watching a bunch of you know weird movies and stuff, and also wrestling, uh, just like both of us. Oh yeah, wrestling. I that like wrestling was the first thing I was ever obsessed with. You know, that's you know, you get obsessed with things. I get, yeah, I got obsessed with wrestling. I was mm-hmm. obsessed with horror movies, and I was obsessed with music and. And, uh, but yeah, wrestling was like, I remember being obsessed with Macho Man and Bret Hart Mm -hmm. as a kid. And it was just like, (laughs) to me, they were like gods. They were like the coolest fucking people ever. And, uh, and then I stayed in, I, I loved it. Um, you know, the Yokozuna era, like starting with like Hacksaw era, like that stuff Mm -hmm. into like, you know, man, all that stuff, man. I, I fucking loved it so much and then I kind of got out of it and I think like the first year of college like I liked it in senior year but didn't really tell people I did <laughs> oh. and, and then went to college and just I don't know why but I got out of it like after the attitude era like after the Stone Cold and DX stuff kind of mm. I didn't watch it during like the Brock Lesnar CM Punk uh, Batista years, I, I kind of didn't watch that stuff. Yeah, honestly, um, as a lifetime wrestling fan, for me, I watch all that stuff just because I w- always watch wrestling. But uh, right, that's really for me when I kind of lost like my real love of it. Like there's stuff that pops up that I like, but I don't have the same connection, like uh, like the emotional connection to wrestling I did in the '80s and the '90s. Right, it was different. Like, and I I got back into it maybe. It, three years ago again, something like that, a little longer than that, like started checking it out again because I was hearing about Daniel Bryant. Right. And it kind of, him and, and uh, Bray Wyatt like kind of got me back into it. Mm-hmm. And um, like, because I just thought their characters were cool. I just thought they were, what they were doing was different. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I got back in and now I'm like 100% back into it and I fucking love all, everything about it and the stupid shit and all. Yeah, um, that, but then you go back and you watch old stuff and you're like, man, it was so much better. Yeah. You know, the, the fucking promos, they cut everything. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but I, I appreciate, I think there, I, I think there's a lot of good guys working today and just seeing people like, like the fact that like Kevin Owens and AJ Styles are the champs in WWE mm-hmm. I, wrestling's in a good place. Yeah. Cause that's something uh, I would never expected, you know, even like five years ago, uh, that's like a lot of those guys from the indie scenes. Just because, like, I I would never think Kevin Owens would even get hired by WWE, let alone you know. No, you think he champion. wouldn't have the Vince look that he yeah. always liked and stuff. You know, and it's really cool right. to see guys that devoted their you know their life to wrestling, uh, regardless of what uh, they you know if they're giants or whatever. Uh, you know, actually make it. That's that's pretty awesome. Yeah, exactly. Like seeing that, like. Like I mean, I, ninety. I I think Samoa Joe is coming up at the Rumble. I think he's going to be so a surprise too. entrant. But yeah. I just the fact that he's in it now, like he's under contract at WWE, he's working at NXT. Mm-hmm. Like that's awesome, man. You know, I remember watching him back in the day, mm-hmm. and him and AJ Styles, and you know, like tuning in to check out TNA and shit. And I never really liked it, but you know, and it, those guys just rule the indies and. It's I it's just awesome. I love seeing these guys come in there, hearing that you know, probably Kenny Omega will come up, or there's so many good guys out there. Yeah, and and women, dude, the fucking women oh, that, yeah. that just that just got signed to NXT, man. Because mm-hmm. I have a local wrestling by me in Dayton, uh, Rockstar Pro, um, that I really dig, and they have awesome matches all the time, and they bring in a lot of special guests, and they had. Oh, a bunch of really good wrestlers recently, and then they just got signed to NXT like the next week, mm-hmm. or they were signed already and were doing their last indie tour or something like that. Yeah, you know? yeah, and it's because I was never a women's wrestling fan. Like, like I like uh, Medusa and I like Sher- Sherry Martel, but for the most part, like I really didn't think the women's wrestling was very good until the last few years with uh, like Sasha Banks and Charlotte and Bailey and Becky. And, you know, like the the new crop. I think are. are you know, you even would think of them as like, used to be almost like, oh, they're good for a woman, for like, uh, you know, uh, for good for a women's wrestler compared to the men. But now I don't even think that way. I think like the the women on Raw are just as good as anybody. It, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, they're fucking, you know, and I think 
when they were divas and like uh, you know in like early two thousands and they were having you know pillow fight matches and shit. I yeah. think there were some amazing women athletes. I just think they were misused. You know, it was a mm-hmm. different era. They were writing different stuff, and now they're you know actually can you know looked at as superstars and they're shining. Like some of the matches, like that fucking Charlotte Sasha Banks you that. Yeah, has been going on over. I mean, I apologize to anybody listening that is not a wrestling fan that we've either put to sleep or made hang up or not listen anymore. But we're 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 off. You know, sorry, uh, the, the seed was planted. Yeah. Um, but that was the best to me feud of last year into I, this I, year. Yeah, like the Falls Count yeah. Anywhere match was just a classic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Dude, one raw. yeah, that was, that awesome. was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Really was. Yeah. Well, I, I do a wrestling podcast, too, as most of the people know, listen. And we did our year-end awards this Tuesday, the Heady Awards. And that actually won match of the year. It was the first time a women's match was ever even, like, got, like, many votes. But this time it, it won match of the year, uh, Charlotte versus uh, Sasha on, uh, on Raw in the Falls Count Anywhere match. Oh, yeah, wow. That tremendous. But that's awesome. That's really awesome to hear that. Yeah, I mean that that was a match, and they were fucking whipping each other with the kendo stick, yeah. right? Yeah, dude, yeah. that some of those shots, man. They were they were taking hits, man. Like that 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 was that was a great fucking match. The, mm-hmm. the ending was great. And, and that was it. Was a good one. I would give that. That'd be up there for me too. As match of the year. Yeah. Some you said earlier, like that you even love like the stupid stuff in wrestling, which that totally is like, like I can love wrestling. Like some of the stuff in wrestling, I think is like genuinely great and like dramatic. But even like the silly kind of stupid stuff, I love too. Is there something yeah. about wrestling? It's hard to explain to someone who's not a wrestling fan why you like wrestling. I it is, and I do with it all the time. I like my job, like you know where. You know, the pay the bills job when I go there and, you know, if I'm talking about it or something, they, you know, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Or I show it to them and they just don't get it at all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then you have these two guys coming out and they're fucking in police uniforms and they're handing <laughs> out. And I'm, I'm, they, I'm like trying to explain what who Fandango is and they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, it's the stupidest thing in the world, but I fucking love the shit out of it. <laughs> it's, yeah. I don't know how to explain it. Yeah. It was, last year I was in the hospital and then rehab for a long time, all summer basically. And uh, when Oh, I was, wow. Yeah, I'd, uh, was, uh, I almost died a bunch of times. And so anyway, when I was in the rehab, um, I shared a room with this 90-year-old man. And so anyway, I was watching uh, wrestling. And uh, our nurse is African American nurse, and she came in, and a new day was on the th- on the screen, like doing some crazy thing with bootios, and I just thought, oh god, she's gonna think like I'm some stupid white guy who thinks all black people act like this, and <laughs> I was like, I don't even want to explain uh, what I'm watching to her, but you know, <laughs> but it was funny anyway. I think she just kind of looked up and just like kind of looked away and, and walked off. But. I know. I uh, I always wondered that and walk around in a booty o shirt, like <laughs> and people are gonna be like, What the fuck is that? And I'm like, No, I swear to God, it's the most positive thing you can ever imagine. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, I wear my booty shirt is. all the time. Mm-hmm. It's probably my favorite. And my daughter's got booty o slippers. <laughs> and, you know, Neil's got a booty o scarf. I've seen it. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's the, sweet. Yeah. Definitely envious of that. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I received a box of bootios for Christmas, and nice. you know, fucking worth all of it. <laughs> <laughs> worth every 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 little marshmallow in there. Yeah, yeah. Now, would you ever do something where you could, could combine wrestling and like a horror movie? Yeah, and that, oddly enough, I am working on something this. Um, some uh no this april we're going to shoot a documentary um about like a crazy hardcore and that's not typically my thing like i love dcw and i still do and i um i'm just not super into that super gore blood stuff like i you know um like i said i love the fucking theatrics and shit um but we're doing a documentary in one of these places and it's supposed to be insane. And I, we're going to be shooting some like 
you know, storyline as well, more like exploitation thing to kind of mix together. It's going to be interesting, unique, mm-hmm. I think. Um, so that's this summer. There's no name or anything yet, but it's set in stone. So we're doing that. I'm not uh, directing that. I'm doing sound and, and uh, camera and helping produce it and all that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. With some people I made a movie with this past summer. So I'm really excited about that, actually. Oh, very cool. Are there any uh, actual wrestlers involved in that? Yeah. Uh, you mean that we're, that we've cast? Yeah. Well, no, because, well, not really. I mean, yeah, for the documentary part, yeah, because I think we're going to be, like, shooting. I don't know the exact formula yet, honestly, but it's, mm-hmm. like, we're going to be, you know, covering some of the wrestlers there and stuff. Um, so there will be, you know, real wrestlers in it. As far as, like, the movie aspect of it, um, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. Sounds interesting. Keep me uh, keep yeah. me in touch with that one. That sounds very cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. That's April. We're shooting that. So, so stoked uh, on that. What other projects do you have uh, in the works? Uh, the movie I made this past summer I worked on was called Savage Nature. Um, that was made. A bunch of uh, friends got together. Um, it was directed by Chris. Noir, who shot the movie Hunters and edited Hunters. If you ever, if you guys have ever heard of that one, um, and um, it stars Haley Madison, Scarlett Storm. It was just a bunch of us went out into the Pennsylvania and made a fucking crazy movie. And really, that one, I don't. It, it's almost done edited right now, and then you know you get to the score and all that shit. So it's got a ways to go, but that Savage Nature. And I uh, just finished editing a movie called Devotion, directed by Jesse Seitz, who was uh, in the documentary. Mm-hmm. He did like that short film where Jim was uh, like the good guy, mm-hmm. where he was acting in. Um, her, she just shot a movie out here, and that was a fun experience. That's done. Um, yeah, so that's really it. Sorry for sounding like I'm rambling. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I got the wrestling thing, devotion, savage nature. Um, yeah, I know I'm probably missing some shit in there too. Um, and then blood wings and shit fuck. <laughs> I'm glad you can curse on this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or else, I don't know. Yeah, what what would you call the movie? What? If you couldn't, what what? How would you refer to the movie at all? SF. Shit fuck. <laughs> yeah, SF. SF I guess. Yeah. How would I say it on your? Sh- I couldn't say it. <laughs> Poop, poop fuck. <laughs> poop sex. <laughs> poop naughty time. I actually <laughs> might change the name to poop fuck. Poop fuck. That's... Uh, I think it's less obvious of what it is. <laughs> I like it. it, it it's... <laughs> <laughs> that one flows. Uh, yeah. The G version. <laughs> I like that you think that, you know, uh, changing the shit to poop Makes it genius. <laughs> fuck is totally fine either way. To call the shit poo. <laughs> That's totally fine. Now the kids can rent it. So yeah, I assume you still have the uh, still have the VHS VCR. Uh, what you know, recent kind of seems like they've been making a comeback. They've been putting like a lot of releases out on VHS. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love the little resurgence it's had, you know. It's still going. Um, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, like releasing the Van Bever stuff on VHS and getting different artists to like, do cover work was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. It's weird because it, they started to seem like uh, release more in VHS, but then I think the last company that made the VCR stopped making them. Uh, yeah, right. This year wasn't the last yeah. VCR actually made. Yeah, really. I didn't know, even yeah. know that. Yeah, that was a very odd time. So you can get stuff on VHS tape, but you can't get anything to play it on. <laughs> yeah, well, you get That's older perfect. ones. Yeah, you have to get ones that are already out there. Oh, okay. Yeah, but they're not making any new v- VCRs at this time being. Yeah, every time you know you go to thrift stores, they're usually like five, ten bucks. Usually yeah. five bucks. Yeah. 
I usually try to scoop them up. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I ever see those, are like camcorders or something old camcorders. I always scoop that stuff up. Half yeah. the time they don't work, but it's worth <laughs> it when they do. Uh, now it looks cool, I guess. Put it around somewhere. So anyway, yeah, last movie I shot, I shot on a VHS camcorder. Really? I mean, the last uh, music video. Yeah, uh-huh. all on VHS. <laughs> uh, why? Was what was the, what was the, what was the reasoning? Uh, wanted it to look like like a '90s public access. Yeah. Uh, like a music video you'd see on there. Like, so I'm like, let's just see it on VHS and. It was fun, you know, because the batteries don't work on those things anymore, so you just got to run fucking extension cords everywhere, and it was an outdoor <laughs> shoot. So, you know, we had two of them, too. Two, it was the two VHS <laughs> uh, camera shoot, and, you know, it looks that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it definitely it looks, I think it looks like a public access thing. So that was the point. It was just, uh, some buddies in Dayton, uh, this band Deuteris, they had a song called Macho Man. So we did a wrestling video, like a backyard wrestling video. <laughs> um, and, nice. and, yeah, it was funny. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. They played it on, uh, not the video, but I think they played this song on the Coca Cabana podcast. Oh, really? That's yeah, crazy. it was like the song of the band of the week, too, I think. Yeah. Something like that, something cool like that. Uh-huh. This is from Christopher Noir. He says, Hey, Cord, stop talking about wrestling. <laughs> nah. He's just having Chris fun. is the one who uh, directed uh, Savage Nature. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the one over there, yeah. Well, There's a lot of Jewish humor in that one. A lot of Jewish the, humor? Yeah, I know I did. a lot of Jewish humor. Hmm. In Savage Nature, it's uh, it's an exploitation. I don't know how to describe it, but yeah, I just thought, I thought I'd throw that out there because right. there's not enough Jewish humor <laughs> in now, in modern days independent uh, exploitation films. Yeah. Now, what do you mean by Jewish humor? Like, do you have to be Jewish to understand? <laughs> well, uh, the director is just uh, he he made a lot of jokes and. Uh, he, he, and a lot of it is writing just kind of was very different and uh we're just like it's Jewish humor. It's uh a lot of the uh there's, there's uh some jokes in the movie and stuff and dialogue that uh are I don't know, I feel like I'm making no sense now. <laughs> it's kind of it was kind of a silly inside joke that uh. Uh, now I sound like a dork. <laughs> it's got a lot of Jewish humor. Yeah, yeah. There's like dreidels everywhere. This is what, this is what I, I, I was going more like Woody Allen, I was thinking. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, yeah, like... Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It was more like stuff that was happening that's not in the movie. Um, and people, like, jokes are made, and I don't think people understand them, but like, oh, it's, it's Jewish humor. <laughs> Uh, John Kinney wants to know who do you think is going to win the Rumble? Sami Zayn. Sam, oh, so that's a, that's a one out of the. Uh, it's a dark horse. I think here yeah, this it's a dark. Uh, and I was talking to my buddy about this the other day, but and he kind of brought it up, and I'm like, that makes a lot of sense because they really are pushing this underdog thing, you know, with him and Ron Strowman, and I think Ron Strowman is the obvious favorite. You know, I don't think any of the legends are going to win it. I think it's going to be Braun, come down to Braun Strowman and Sami Zayn is going to flip him out. And uh, it's going to be like a Daniel Bryant Royal Rumble win. And that sets up Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, WrestleMania for the belt. And then you have Samoa Joe fighting AJ Styles for the other belt. That's just my fantasy. But. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That'd be, I would be for that. It, it's, uh, it's going to be a shame if it's just... Like, after all the work AJ's done and Kevin Owens, if the title's a switch, you know, to, like, the, uh, kind of the Golden Boys of WWE Cena and Reigns. I know. Do we really need to see Roman Reigns as a champ again? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm really happy to see, like, Chris Jericho as a, a champion, and I think they need to keep it on. But, I mean, AJ Styles, to me, is, like, the best wrestler in the world. Yeah, he's been great. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, like and, I was, uh, I always loved watching him in in uh, TNA, but he wasn't like a great talker or anything. But he's really become all around uh, performer in WWE. 
Oh, absolutely. And he's better as a heel. You know, yeah. he's he's better. Yeah, he's so much better. When he first came up to WWE, I'm like, ooh, he's my, you know. But he's, since his turn, he's just, he's so good. Mm. And, uh, and I think, you know, they obviously have them tone it down, you know. Uh, it's like the cruiserweight thing. Like, the reason I don't think that's taken off is like, I know those guys are great, but you know, on the cruiserweight uh, classic, like they were, it was unbelievable. And then they came up, and there was no storylines or anything, and it's just these guys doing. But it's already toned down from what they were previously yeah. doing. And so, you, and you see, like uh, guys like AJ and Sami Zayn and Rollins, you kind of see that style anyway on the show. So if it's like toned down, it doesn't really stand out. It doesn't stand out, you're saying? Yeah, like the, those guys? For, for the cruiserweights, because they're doing stuff that, like, the other guys are doing anyway. Oh, you, yeah, I mean, that's that's a good point, too. I didn't even, I mean, I didn't really even think about that, like, because they are doing that. You have guys, top guys, that are doing crazy aerial aerial moves, and that's true. Yeah, and on the Cruiserweight Classic, they were presented as... Uh, as something special, and each of the matches meant something, as opposed to, like you said, it's just some random guy, random new guys on the show having matches just for the sake of matches, you know? Right, exactly. And they don't really have pers- like they have personalities, but nothing that like this audience has seen, mm-hmm. and they're all working together a lot for the first time, and mm-hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, I think I think there's a lot of components to that. Like that T.J. Perkins guy, like he's. You know, he's super talented, but there's just something that doesn't click. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like where, like, he's very similar to Bailey, but Bailey, to me, clicks. Yeah. Like, it works. And she's not the best wrestler in the world, like, technically, mm-hmm. but she's got a character down, and she lives it, and it works. It clicks, and it connects to the audience, and it's entertaining. Something about that works, and something about, like, T.J. Perkins just doesn't. Mm-hmm. And, I don't know. Yeah. Again, I'm going off on a ridiculous <laughs> tangent, and I no, apologize. No, I totally understand. She just has a she has a natural likability about her that people just want to see her uh, succeed. And above everything, I think above your wrestling ability or anything, if you connect with connecting with the audience is what is the main thing in in wrestling, or really in any any form any form of entertainment. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many people that like to me weren't. You know, we're oh, and I don't mean like sounding like jerk. I'm oh, I'm not a wrestler, but like some of the guys that weren't really amazing wrestlers, but they were so good on the on Million Dollar Man. You know, he I don't remember really too many of his matches or him putting on classics, but he was such a great character and had it down and owned it, and he's so memorable. And there's fucking wrestling buddies still for him, you know, and he was in all the video games, so. Yeah, and also when There's you mentioned, part of it. Yeah, when you mentioned ECW earlier, I always think that's something that's overlooked about ECW. That people just think of like uh, it was you know blood and guts and stuff, but I think it, what really made it stand out was uh, the emotional connection to the wrestlers and the company itself. Like you wanted it, you wanted it to succeed. Oh, dude, I think ECW like that. Dude, the connection that they had with the audience is mm-hmm. just never topped. It's to me, you know, that's the first time you've seen that, where it was, like, so insane and so close to each other. And some of the shit that I, you know, I love DCW. Um, and I think some of those guys are, you know, overlooked in that way. But they were great. Yeah. And they were characters and stuff. It was just more badass. Yeah, yeah. But what, I'm sure you've seen it. That's uh, oh god, beyond the mat, and uh, the, the oh yeah part with Heyman doing the 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 you know right before the pay per view, getting everyone psyched. That's like so so emotional and so powerful. Oh yeah, I love that documentary. Yeah, a, yeah. even the that's begin- a good one. Yeah, the be- they follow. That's when they get Terry Funk, right? They yeah, get Terry McFoley. Uh huh. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, definitely. Well, everyone should check out Diver Deadbeat. Even if you don't know, if Absolutely. you know Jim Van Beber, you're gonna love it. I think even if you don't know him, you're gonna love it, uh, especially for people who uh, who listen to this type of show. Yeah, th- uh, thanks for having me on and everything. Um, What's going on? Check out my sorry if I rambled about stupid shit or <laughs> no, we had um, a lot of fun. You know, 
But I appreciate everybody that did check it out and that does, and I appreciate you guys for having me on and allowing me to ramble. Of course. Um, yeah, yeah, check out my dog. If you guys don't know who Jim Van Bever is, check it out. I think yeah, people I think will appreciate him. He's an important part of like American filmmaking. It's mm-hmm. been kind of unseen. Yeah. <laughs> It's definitely, you know, uh, I wasn't super familiar with him, obviously, uh, honestly, before the uh, documentary, but it definitely uh, made me want to go and see the, the rest of his work. Oh, right on. That's awesome. Yeah. And I did part of my job. Exactly, exactly. All right, man, well, thanks for coming on. We really, really uh, appreciate it. Ah, uh, thank you so much. This is Sue Vicious, and you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com.